Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you as always by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope you had a wonderful weekend. I hope your week is starting off well. All of those good things, you know, our weekend as usual was pretty quiet. I mean, I, I know I say that a lot, but hey, that's the that's the fun of of staying home because of COVID. <laughs> we, we have very quiet weekends. And you know what? As an introvert, I am okay with that. My massively extroverted husband, not as much with the okayness. But uh, for me, that's kind of what I would do anyway. So hasn't changed too much for me in terms of what I like to do on the weekend. Stay home, read a book, watch a movie, whatever. Crochet, work on crafts. Good stuff. I'm um pretty boring I would say at any rate I hope your weekend was full of something that brings you joy you know especially maybe a good book always a good thing that brings me joy as I mentioned at the end of the last episode today I am speaking with author Chris Mooney about his new thriller called Blood World the uh, the tagline on the book is or on the cover is the future is written in blood And the description is as follows. Everything changed when scientists discovered the drug. It looked like the cure for aging, but all progress comes with a price tag. Now eternal youthfulness will be paid for by the blood of the innocent. The blood of quote-unquote carriers is the most valuable commodity on earth. When treated with a new wonder drug, carrier blood cures disease increases power, and makes the recipient a virtual superhuman. It also makes the carriers targets. Young people with the right genes are ripped from their families and stashed in blood farms. Ellie Batista became an LAPD officer specifically to fight this evil as a member of the Blood Crimes Unit, but her ambitions are thwarted until the day she and her partner are ambushed during a routine stop. The resulting events plunge her into an undercover world more dangerous than she could ever have imagined. A madman has found a way to increase the potency of carrier blood to levels previously unimagined. As this man cuts a bloody swath through the already deadly world of blood cartels, Ellie is the only hope to stop him before the body count explodes. And again, that is the description of Blood World by Chris Mooney. It is, as you can tell, a thriller. It's speculative fiction set, you know, somewhere in the very near future or maybe even the now, <laughs> but in a slightly alternate, uh, a slightly altered present. And the premise definitely plays on a lot of fears that our society has about getting older, about searching for that that one thing that's going to keep us younger, longer. And it, it goes one step further because you have these carriers who have a certain type of blood. And then, of course, you've got the science aspect to it. So there's a, a new wonder drug that, when combined with the carrier blood, produces these amazing effects. And you can just imagine all of the, I was going to say shenanigans that ensue. Not really shenanigans, you know. <laughs> Not shenanigans, but um, all of the, well, the, the sort of insidious and frankly, evil uh, plots that ensue with these blood farms and the kidnapping of carriers and just 
people who have the means getting this blood and this drug by any means possible so that they can have these enhanced abilities and stay younger, longer, be healthier, etc. All of those, all those fears that we have and all of those highlighted issues of society in terms of haves and have nots come into play. Ellie as a character, I like. She is tough. She is determined. She is flawed like any good protagonist should be. She's got her own reasons for why she has this need to be in the blood crimes unit and those are explained throughout the book. I, of course, am not going to give that away. Uh, I do like her a lot as a character. I could definitely see if there were other books set in this world. I would um, definitely see Ellie as a character that I would want to continue following to get to know a little better, to continue to go on these sort of well, these investigations. Again, I was going to say adventures. I'm making this like way too light <laughs> but to continue with these investigations with Ellie as she continues to pursue justice as she sees fit. So again, the book is called Blood World. It is a thriller. It's speculative fiction. There's a little science fiction thrown in there. All of those wonderful genres. The author is Chris Mooney. And let's go ahead and turn now to that discussion with Chris. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I am excited to have you here. We are here to talk about your book, um, Blood World. Before we get to the book, though, if you would share a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Sure. Uh, I My name is Chris Mooney. I grew up just outside of Boston. I have been writing professionally for for a long, long time, at least, I'm going to say a good 20 years. Um, I've been very, very fortunate in, in my career. Uh, I did a great series with this character called Darby McCormick. Blood World is my first foray into like kind of blending a little sci-fi in, into crime. And that's what I'm known for is crime writing, thriller writing. And I've also recently started working with James Patterson. So it's a whole bunch of stuff going on. I feel uh, really, really fortunate. And, and I start school teaching school again this week. So lots of stuff going on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, teaching school in person or distance learning? Distance learning. I've been teaching creative writing over Zoom for, I'm going to say the past four years. So I w I'm used to it and the class is small and it's only one night a week. But I don't know how regular students do it all day or t how teachers do it day in and day out because it's a whole other way of learning. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. And uh, you mentioned James Patterson. You can tell us if he is human or not because I don't know when the man sleeps. <laughs> he seems like he's he, so busy. He, he is very busy. He is human. Uh, he is an idea machine. And... It's, I got to be honest, it's the working with him has been so creatively fun. It's, uh, yeah, I feel like every day I go when I do work for him and do his projects, I feel like I'm going to, you know, this creative playground. And it's been, it's been so much, it's really, it's been just a lot, a lot of fun. And we have a book coming out next month called, on the 15th, I think, called A Walk in My Combat Boots. And it's these stories, these very, you know, very short stories of soldiers, the stuff they went through overseas, the stuff they went through when they came back home. It's, it's nonfiction. And we're, I'm so excited to be a part of that. It was really a dream come true. And I learned so much more about the military and what our, our young men and women uh, not only did over there on a daily basis, but everything they gave up to do what they needed to do overseas. It was a very eye-opening and humbling experience. Oh, I bet. Wow, that sounds that sounds really great. Um, but let's talk about the, uh, your, your new book, uh, the current book out right now. Um, it's called Blood World. Can you give yep. an overview of that story? Sure. The first thing is, it's not, it's not a sci-fi novel. It's a very easy premise, and the premise is this. In the not-so-distant future, say in the next five years, scientists discover that there are two types of people. There are people, normal people like us, who have normal blood, 
and then there's other people called carriers. And what that means is they have this gene that is constantly replenishing their blood. So they don't age as fast as we do. Their metabolism runs high. They have more energy. They sleep well. They don't really get sick. Or if they do, you know, they, they heal very quickly or they get over really quickly. And what you find out is that if a carrier's blood is transfused into a normal person or a non-carrier, they get all of these benefits, but on steroids. And what ends up happening is there's this whole thing, business that opens up where carriers, usually young, younger people, are kidnapped and they're harvested for their blood. So there's these blood farms operating in and around Los Angeles, and the police are desperately trying to catch up to what's happening and how they can solve these crimes because they're short-staffed and they still don't know how all of this scientific stuff and medical stuff works. So that's how the book opens up. And it's a straight crime story about one guy who owns the biggest and most lucrative and also the most secretive blood farm in Los Angeles. His name's Sebastian. And the story is also told from the perspective of a young woman named Ellie who wants to become and who's a regular patrolman and wants to become an undercover cop to get into this blood world because nobody knows where these blood farms are. No, nobody knows really anything about it. So the readers on that journey of discovery, as well as Ellie, which I think makes it really, really exciting. Yeah, it's definitely, um, it, it, it keeps you, it keeps you hooked <laughs> trying to figure everything yeah. out along with Ellie and, you know, it's always interesting when books come out because they, you know, it's not like you wrote this last month. It, it takes a while to write a book and get it published, et cetera. So it's kind of yep. interesting that this came out during a pandemic. Not that, you know, it's a it's a straight parallel, but there were times in the book when I was like, hmm, this feels very timely. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of talk about conspiracies and, you know, how things don't exist and, and those right. of, um, conversations. So. I thought that was interesting timing. Can you talk a little bit more about Ellie as the main character and um, what about her you think might resonate with readers? I love writing about strong female characters. I prefer writing about women. Uh, I did a series with a character named Darby McCormick. Um, I don't know it was, I don't know how many books, maybe about eight or nine. And I just like telling stories from different points of view. And I like, with Ellie's case, I'm a, always a big believer in that, you know, when you see, you know, usually when you see these stories, it's like a, it's like the young male det detective, the young male patrolman's going to climb up the ladder or the young army guy's going to do this. And we live in a day and age where there are boundless examples and, hopefully they keep growing of young women who can pretty much do anything that uh, a man, man can do. I work out, I do this really crazy workout thing called CrossFit. Don't ask why I'm attracted to it. And there are My women I work. Totally fascinated. <laughs> so I, I get it. <laughs> and there are women I work out with of various ages who are, very strong and very tough. Now, could they bench press as much as me? Probably some could, you know, and I just find it really, really fascinating that I grew up with all of these stories in, in, in books where women played like kind of a supporting role or if they were in a horror movie, their, their job was just to scream and do stuff. And I like seeing, uh, I like bringing women into uh, a more modern light in showing them how smart they are, how dedicated they are, how resourceful they are. And I just find it fun to be in their company. And as a guy who thinks he knows about women, uh, my wife always goes, oh, no, no, you know absolutely nothing about women. <laughs> you know, it's always just constantly a learning experience. So it's really, really fun to write from that point of view. Does your wife ever have um, uh, notes from a, a female perspective yes. when you write? <laughs> yes. So, so I consider 
or I should say, I considered myself someone who, you know, as a writer, you're always observing and stuff and pretty open-minded and all of these things. And I remember when I wrote this book called The Missing, and that was the first one in this the series with Darby McCormick. And I gave her these sample pages and she read them while I was in my office and I hear her laughing and I'm in my office going, oh, she got to this funny part or this funny line, that's that and the other thing. And I'm beaming with all of this pride. And then she comes in and I said, oh, well, what did you think? And she just laughed and says, you really know nothing about women. And that's where that quote came from that I just told you about earlier. And it, you know, she had to explain to me, and this is years and years ago, about how, you know, women look at things, how some women, I don't mean to generalize, look at things differently, how, you know, their relationships can be a little bit more different than men. And it's just been such a great education. So, yeah, I have, uh, I have plenty of women who read the drafts and stuff to make sure I'm not saying anything that isn't that isn't plausible well or and i don't know if <laughs> i don't know if you've ever read the, the the threads on social media of um just really bad examples of of male authors writing female characters i mean these are like extreme bad and so right i'm always yeah yeah you didn't you didn't commit any of those so <laughs> that's yeah well that's did. good that's writing 101 that's great <laughs> right. i mean there's probably little things uh, you know, like maybe a turn of phrase or something. I know someone said, oh, a woman probably wouldn't phrase it like that. That stuff I'm fine with. As long as I don't embarrass myself, that, that's the main <laughs> right. thing. Or take right. the reader out of the story. I really hope that came across the way I was hoping that it came across as, you know, a, a bit of a compliment, not me trying to get on a male author for writing a female protagonist, because I have read those really bad examples and this book does not contain those really bad examples so it was supposed to be a compliment of uh, of a well-written female protagonist and sometimes I don't know sometimes I, I get a little self-deprecating or I'm just never sure if the way I am saying things comes across as the way I intend it or rude or weird but um hopefully Chris understood where I was coming from and Chris it really was a compliment so I hope that's the way you took it we're going to take our first break of the podcast, and when we come back, we'll be talking about Chris's in initial inspiration for Blood World. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or any where you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, where I will try to make it through the rest of the interview without giving author Chris Mooney any backhanded compliments. I can't make any promises. You've been listening long enough that you know I'm socially awkward. Uh, at any rate, the book again is called Blood World. The author is Chris Mooney. Let's return to the interview. So what was your initial inspiration for this particular book? It was, I was reading this story, I think it was from Wired Magazine, that was talking about all of these really, really rich, I mean, either multi, high multimillionaires or billionaires in Silicon Valley who have decided to take their considerable wealth and use it to, quote, biohack, launch, you know, to extend life. It's like, wow, that's really amazing. And they went into it all it all of it involved blood. And there was this trend of, well, if you get a transfusion from someone who's younger into an older person, that will, you know, 
that can ha there's really there's some scientific evidence on this that you know it could kind of jumpstart your system again, but nothing has been been really done. But then they start mixing certain drugs with it. One was a diabetes drug, and they've noticed that there was some like enhancements. It's it's still in its infancy, but the way my brain works at least is kind of like Stephen King's, which is I come across something and he always says, he'll read something and that voice clicks on his, in his head and says, what if this actually happened? And that's kind of what started that. Well, what if this actually happened? What would life look like now if there was actually such a blood existed? And what if it was in people already that they had some sort of genetic makeup like what would the landscape look like and the answer i came up with was was blood world and all of that stuff is that you know at the end of the day people will go to extraordinary lengths to extend not only their life but the lives of of their loved ones and what does it look like if you can't afford such a thing what would life look like going forward and what are the ethics involved? And, you know, for example, you know, I don't know, let's say my wife is really, really sick and someone comes to me in this future scenario and says, well, if she gets a blood transfusion with a certain blood product and this one, it's called Pandora. It will not only save her life, but there's a good chance it will just knock the cancer or whatever disease away. The catch is it's a moral choice. If I had the money to do this, and I know this blood was taken from someone who was kidnapped off the street and basically forced to give it up, and this person may be dead or may just be in a blood farm constantly being poked and prodded for blood, would I do that? And I don't know what the answer to that is. It's not an, it's not a, it's not an easy it's not an easy answer. And as a writer, I'm always attracted to those, you know, those Sophie choice moments, I call them. So if you choose this, this happens. If you choose this, that happens. And there's consequences to both things. And how do you learn to live with those consequences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So did you do any, um, any specific research then on you know, kind of this speculative process, or um, did you kind of take the idea and run with it in your own way? I took the idea and ran with it in my own way. One of the big, I did talk to uh, a doctor friend and ran stuff by them, who's also, <clears throat> excuse me, a writer. But I, the main thing I always wanted to do with a book like this is allow the reader just to jump in and not get bogged down with with all this medical stuff, with all this science stuff, or in, in this case, with any sci-fi stuff. It's literally, literally you can jump in. You, I told you what the premise is. This, that's all you really need to know. And the rest of it, you can kind of pick up along the way. But it really just needs to satisfy, like, you know, in theory, could something like this happen? And the answer was yes. It's like, oh, okay. And then it became, all right, well, what's a blood transfusion look like? So there was some medical stuff that goes along with that because that's a valid procedure and there are certain things that you need to do. So that was really the extent of the research on that end. Okay. And um, what about, so you, you write crime fiction, um, and then this is, um, a little, this is more toward the speculative speculative fiction because yep. it's set in a not so distant future so what about first crime fiction and then um speculative fiction appeals to you i definitely love writing thrillers and i'm still writing them uh starting a new series and i'm always attracted to that but this was one of those things it was one of those ideas that kind of kept knocking and i didn't i didn't want to write a sci-fi book i didn't i'm not I don't have any interest per se in the amount of world building you need to do. I don't have that skill, nor did I want to put all of my time and energy into that. Like I always think of George R. R. Martin sitting down to write one of his books, one of his big, big books in the Game of Thrones series. 
And I don't know how he does it, you know, knowing all those characters and you have to have the world. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of time and energy it takes to write something like that, which probably explains why it takes him so many years to, to write those books. So what I did is I did not a shortcut, but I was watching this is great TV show called Black Mirror. It's on Netflix, I think. And they do this stuff. It's like, well, in not so distant future. The, you know, here's the story of that story. But it's accessible enough where it doesn't feel like science fiction. So in the case of Blood World, there's no flying cars. There's, there's none of that stuff. It's what our world looks right now in present day. It's just adding this small element of a scientific discovery. So that's all, that's all it really, really is. And it was also interesting to me i wanted to, to tell a dual story which is you have ellie who is the young person who infiltrates the blood world and sebastian who owns this blood owns multiple blood farms and i wanted the reader to see it from his perspective why he's doing what he's doing you know and he was actually the thing that attracted me is i wanted to write about a bad guy that you're going to read about and go, I really like him. I want to spend time with him. I get where he's coming from. I don't necessarily agree with him, but I'm very intrigued to see what he does next because I don't know what he's capable of. So that was a lot of fun. And watching Ellie and Sebastian intersect, those are all the crime things that I love writing about, all of the moral issues. So it just became kind of a natural fit. And it was something different. And Every now and then, I like to kind of branch out and try different things. I I have a, a kind of a love hate with characters like Sebastian because <laughs> you know nobody yep. is is all one thing or another. You know, no one is black and white. But you, you know, sometimes when you're reading, you just want to dislike someone. <laughs> you want him. Right. You want him to be the bad guy. You want Ellie to be the the, the good guy, and you want to move on from right. there. You know, the right. gray areas. You're like, shoot, this is actual life. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. It, but it's also that the other reason Sebast, I, I liked writing about Sebastian was I was a big fan of The Sopranos, as a lot of people were. And, you know, when you pull away from it, what you're really doing is you're watching a TV show and kind of rooting for a guy who kills people and does bad things. And he cheats on his wife, yet he loves his wife. You know, he loves his kids, but he's also angry with them all the time. He wants to be a better person, and he goes to therapy, but he doesn't know how to kind of pull everything in. And it's a fascinating thing for me as a writer and also as a viewer to watch, and I really wanted to try that with Sebastian. So is Sebastian a bad guy? Yeah, absolutely. Is he, is he a Bond villain, you know, from the, from the early 80s? the Roger Moore things? No, uh, absolutely not. There's, there's, there's different sides to them. Just as you see with Ellie, who goes into something with the best of intentions, she has to bump up against certain things and make certain difficult choices that compromise who she is. And it's just not, as we all know, it's not that easy in life, but it's interesting watching people make difficult decisions and how they how they deal with them, and that's why I think we read at least why I read fictions. It gives us some sense of order to our own life, or maybe how we'd like to behave in certain situations. And at the end of the day, my job is to have you pick up a book and not be able to put it down. That's what I always strive for. It's always to entertain the reader. It's always to go. I don't know what's going to happen next. And that's always what I'm striving for. It's not a lecture on, you know, society or politics or, or anything, really. It's just kind of a fast, fun ride filled with what I hope are really interesting characters. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you would return to this character or this world in another book? Yeah, I wrote it in a way where that the world in and of itself could be visited, you know, a number of times. And I came up with the idea of a trilogy and it's something I might go back to. Absolutely. It's definitely not off the table. 
Okay. And you said that you're working on a new series now. Is there uh, anything you can share about that? No, I mean, I literally just started working on it. It, it basically, you have, a, I mean, I can give you the, the little log line, which is you have, I have a character whose name is Michael Shepard, who was a former army ranger who's also an FBI profiler now. And he, he be, he's the FBI's most celebrated profiler, and then he suddenly becomes the FBI's most wanted man for reasons he doesn't yet understand. So that's what I'm working with right now. I don't know what's okay. happening. Yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, it always works like this. I know how it opens. I thought, all right, this is a great idea. Oh, this is how it opens. Wow, this is a great idea. I love this, this, and that. I know how it ends. I have no idea how to get between the two when I start out. Uh, uh, that, uh, some people would uh, completely be comfortable with that, and other people would just not be comfortable with, <laughs> with trying to write something, you know, without knowing the middle. But I, I know a lot of uh, yeah, everyone's authors. Everyone's process is different. Yeah, exactly. Time for our second break of the podcast. When we come back, Chris will be talking about his Darby series and some of the books within that series. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I have been speaking with author Chris Mooney about his new thriller, Blood World. We are going to move on to some of his other writings, specifically his Darby series. You mentioned um, Walk in My Combat Boots that you, you worked yep. on with James Patterson. Are there any of your other books that you would like to highlight? I'm very proud of, of the Darby series. That did really, really well especially overseas. And the first book in that is The Missing. And you can find out if you want to know about her adventures. The great thing about that series is you can jump in at any point. And you can find out all that information on chrismooneybooks.com. It has all of that information for people who want to want to know what that is. Okay. You said you've been writing for over 20 years. So is it something that you always wanted to do then? Always wanted to do it. I knew from, I think I was 12. The the story I always give, and it's because it's true, is growing up in Boston, we had this thing, and I'm dating myself with my age here, but we had this thing called Creature Double Feature. And we actually had a TV that had knobs on it that you had to turn. And we had the, you know, the antenna. Mm -hmm. And what what happened was they showed on Saturdays and Sundays, they would show the black and white horror movies from the 50s on, you know, the afternoon. And at night they showed kind of the, the color ones that were a little bit gorier. And... I was being babysat one night when I was 12. My parents were on the date night. And I remember sitting there with my grandmother, the cool one, not the Irish Catholic one, who would have would not have allowed me to watch this stuff. She was sitting next to me, and I saw an ad for The Shining, the movie. I didn't know what it was. The music was ominous. 
the tone was ominous. But the thing that, that scared the hell out of me was a scene where the elevator doors open and all this blood comes out. And I was like, oh, my God, I had never been more terrified of something. And at the same time, wanted to see it. Begged my parents, begged them, can I see it, can I see it, can I see it, to the point my father said, your mother and I are going to go see it next weekend, we'll let you know. And I waited for them to come home from their date night, and I ran upstairs, and I went to my father, can I see it? And my mother said, there's absolutely no way in hell you're ever going to see that movie. And I was so intrigued more, because I had to see it. And I had made some preparations, because I found out it was based on a book, it came in at the library. My father drove me down to get it. The librarian wouldn't give it to me, said it was not appropriate for me. She wasn't going to give it. Brought my father in. My father argued with the library the librarian. I thought the cops were going to be called. I ended up getting the book. I thought it was, I was like, I can't wait to read this. And I remember sitting down at night, getting home and reading it to like two in the morning. And then finally had to stop because I was tired. But I remember when I closed that, it was, this is what I want to do with my life. Like that power that that book had to go and just suck me away from life and go into this imaginary world that was so beautifully told. I love that feeling and I've been chasing it ever since. And I knew what, that's what I wanted to do with my own writing. So when I sit down to write, I'm always trying to give the reader I'm always trying to replicate that experience I got when I read The Shining or Stephen King's The Dead Zone or Silence of the Lambs or any of the, any of those really um, indelible books to, from, you know, from my, my childhood. So you read The Shining. Did, did, you, did you ever get to watch it? I mean, obviously, as an adult, you could have, but did your parents ever let you see it? I guess. What ended up happening is we ended up getting a VCR. And uh, one, one of the first ones, and I don't know how old I was. I wasn't that much old. I'm going to say maybe 15 or 16. And I rented it. You know, there were a few places where you could rent them, and I rented it, and it was, it was great. It was so, so great. And I'm surprised they let me – I can't believe I'm going to tell this story, but I'm surprised they let me do it because we got cable, and I heard about – a, show, a movie called The Exorcist, which I had never seen, and my my ba my room was down in the ba not the basement, but there was a low basement level we converted to bedrooms, and there was a TV room down there and all those stuff. So the, we had a third bedroom that was downstairs, and I had set an alarm to wake up in the middle. Of, I, I wanted to, it was the middle of the night, but it was like probably two or so in the morning, and I watched it downstairs so quietly. And it was literally in front of the TV. And there was a scene where the mom comes in and Reagan's upstairs screaming and her head spun around, which I didn't know about. I screamed. I was so scared. I screamed at the top of my lungs. <laughs> and my parents thought someone was breaking into the house. Mm -hmm. And my father never, ever let me live that down, ever. There's no way you're going to see a scary movie again. I begged him to see Alien when that was on cable. Uh, I finally did that. That scared me to death. And he's like, see, I told you, you're not ready for this. But I just, <laughs> I love those. I love those stories. I don't know why. I just did. And I, and I know a lot of people do. But yeah, those, yeah. those are my, um, <laughs> that was my early upbringing. So people go, where do you get your ideas from? I'm like, well, you know, cable came along. They think, you know, I had some, I grew up in a basement with pain and all this other stuff. And like, no, no, normal person. Swear to God. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's funny. From, from your own experience, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yeah, it's the, the I have a couple pieces of, of advice because I do teach creative writing and I get to see, I kind of see the same thing over and over again uh, for the, the, you know, the number of years I've been doing this. And, and the first thing is you have to read a lot. If you want to be a writer, you have to read and you have to read everything. And people are always surprised when I go, I really don't read that many thrillers. I was like, really? I thought you would have to read that. And I go, no, I read pretty much everything. And, you know, I've read all, not all, but most of the Oprah book club books, uh, a lot of literary stuff. Uh, I am probably 
one of the few guys uh, on the planet who will admit to reading the first Twilight books because they were so popular, and I wanted well, I wanted to know what this was about. So I, I kind of read read everything, and I say you have to read because you have to know how to tell a story. And most writers who are writing are just focused on writing and not telling the story. And you need to tell a story. And if you can do that, there's a good chance, you know, you can do it for a living, but not a lot of people know how to do it like that. And then what's the second piece of advice is, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and if it's something that you really want to do, you know, don't let anyone stand in your way. I knew I wanted to do it. I was told, oh, no, 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 you'll, you'll never do this. You can't do this. But I was obsessed with keeping working and figuring out stuff and how to generate better ideas. So I, you know, I was a, I was a book nerd in a lot of ways as a kid. You know, I was, I was the jock who was also this book nerd and who loved Stephen King and all of this other stuff. So, you know, you got to read, read a lot and you got to write a lot. Those are the two, two biggest things. Makes perfectly good sense to me. It is time for our last break of the podcast. When we come back, the conclusion of my interview with Chris. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. are back with my final segment in this book review podcast with author Chris Mooney. We have been talking about a lot of different topics, of course. Before the break, we were talking about some of his advice for aspiring authors. And as a teacher of creative writing, I thought that maybe he would have some different perspectives on how he reads books. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we return to the interview. As a, a teacher of creative writing, do you ever find it harder to just sit down and read and enjoy a story, or are you constantly critiquing? Surprisingly, when I watch something or read something, I just want to be entertained. But, uh, and by entertained, I mean I just want to get sucked into the story and and do that. Like I don't want to to. I'm not in critique mode. I know of, I know of a lot of writers who, it's just a natural thing where you can sit down. And you're like, all right, I see where this is going, where that's going. Like for example, my wife and I watched uh, The Undoing on HBO with Nicole Kidman and uh, Hugh Grant, and I really, really liked it. But as I'm watching it, and there's more twists and more this and more that. The, the writer part of me goes, all right, they're really narrowing the focus. So it, there's only a couple of alternatives that can really be left. And so in that aspect, I kind of guessed what was going to happen, but I never sit down. I never sit down to do that. I'm not the guy who's like, let me tell you what's going to go, gonna go on here. Like, I'm not, not that. I just I want to be as amazed and thrilled or surprised as, as anyone else. I, I would imagine that um, if you were the guy that wanted to critique everything, you'd be very hard to watch movies with. <laughs> so it's probably good that yeah, you're I, there for the story. Yeah, I don't want to be that guy. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. oh, I can tell you where this is going. People are like, who cares? Shut up. Nobody's asking. <laughs> right. Let me go. Let me get there on my own. Thank you. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
uh, you read a lot. You read lots of different t genres, but do you have uh, favorite authors or genres that you turn to when you're reading just for you? No, I don't. I, actually, I don't have a particular genre that I read a lot of nonfiction lately, mainly because it's usually I'm usually reading something for some research purposes or to understand something that I'm going to be writing about. But you know, I read, uh, you know, people are surprised when I go, I was saying this to a guy who is writing these these kind of romantic, historical romance books, but they're very literary. And I said, you should read Nicholas Sparks' The Notebook. He's like, what? I said, The Notebook. I go, that's the one that launched his career. You should really, really read that. He goes, isn't he a romance writer? I go, he writes, yeah, he writes romances, but who cares? Like, it's such a great story. And that, at the end of the day, that's all I care about. So, yeah, I read that. I read The Bridges of Madison County when that was a huge, huge thing. I read the first Fifty Shades. I read one of, one of those. and That was, you know, that was interesting. But I'll, I'll generally reread everything. I read a lot of stuff that Stephen King recommends because I find that he... I share his same taste, same thing with Dennis Lehane. I read this, uh, I've just read so many great, great stories. And I try to read a lot of that from female authors, from African-American authors. And um, it's just, yeah, I try to devour anything that kind of comes in my past. Okay, thank you for that. You mentioned your website, so if you could remind people of uh, the website as well as um, where they can find you on social media. Okay. My website is chrismooneybooks.com. All of the social media stuff is is there. You can click on it. will take you to there. Like C. Mooney Books is my Twitter handle. Chris Mooney Books is uh, my Facebook handle. And same thing with Instagram. So if you follow me, I promise you I won't be bombarding your media feed with what I ate for breakfast and all of that nonsense stuff. But, you know, I give book recommendations. I talk about things that I've seen. I share stuff about, you know, what I'm currently doing in my writing process. And, you know, you can find out all of the stuff that I'm doing on any of those, any and all of those social feeds. Well, I don't know. What what did you have for breakfast today? Maybe maybe people want to know. Oh, <laughs> uh, if you saw what I ate on a daily basis, you would think that I live in a nursing home. It's the same it, my life is it's the same breakfast, you know, and then it's the same snack, like a banana and a fuel for fire, and then I go work out and do that cross that crazy CrossFit stuff, and then I come back and then I have the you know Whatever the my prepackaged lunch that I ordered, it's it's I could be a, either a monk or a great old person living in a nursing home. I'm not quite sure. It's made me very very productive and very boring. This, that's the trade off. I'm very productive, well, but I'm also very yeah. Boring. <laughs> you're also very boring. <laughs> um, or maybe you're just. Well, see, predictable isn't a great word there either. So um, no, it's I, don't, I don't predictable's know. a good word. It's, I'm, yeah, I've um, always been like that. I, I've been a schedule kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Well, Chris, we've talked about the book and we've talked about writing. Um, is there anything, though, that we haven't covered that you would hope to bring up or mention during our time together? Just that if you read Blood World, um, thank you. I get a lot of people have read it and will send me DMs or emails. And, say, you know, I appreciate that. And if you enjoy it, you know, if you could post an, a review on Amazon, that will help. That helps spread the word for for any author, not just me. And uh, thank you for your time. This was excellent. I really appreciate it. As always, thank you once again to Chris Mooney for joining me to talk about Blood World, his new novel, as well as some of his other writings and all sorts of other fun topics. If you are a fan of speculative fiction, of science fiction, but, you know, not spacey science fiction, <laughs> it's not all space. I know this. It's not all space operas. If you're a fan of um, 
thrillers and strong female protagonists, strong but flawed female protagonists, then you should definitely check out Blood World. If you're a fan of Chris Mooney in general, then of course you should check out Blood World. But thank you so much to Chris. Thank you as always for you, my listeners, for hanging out and joining me for one more author interview. You know that I love doing them and I love sharing them with you. So thank you for always coming along on the journey. I really appreciate it. If you are a fan of this podcast, and hopefully you are, if you are still listening at this point in the podcast and you're still listening after however many podcasts you've listened to, then please do me the favor of following me on social media Well, following the podcast on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, GSMC Book Review. Just type it in. You'll find us there. Come and interact with me. Ask questions. Tell me what you're reading. Um, tell me which authors you've particularly enjoyed. Maybe you found a new author from one of the interviews you heard. I love hearing from listeners. So hit me up on social media and tell me what's going on in your reading life. In addition to following on social media, something else that you can do that is very, very helpful is to leave a review. You can write a review or you can leave um, hopefully a five star review, although really I'm not, you know, I'm not here to tell you what to do. But if you could uh, leave a review that really helps us get this podcast out to more book lovers such as yourself. So if you haven't done that already, please take just a brief moment to leave a review, Uh, take a slightly longer brief moment to write a few sentences of about what you enjoy of the podcast um, or what you maybe could maybe some constructive criticism that's always nice as well just you know be nice please I would appreciate that I I appreciate constructive criticism but I don't want to feed the trolls so don't be a troll (laughs) because I don't want to feed you at any rate I hope you'll join me next time when I, we're switching gears from thriller. We've had a couple of, you know, thrillers, action-y books the last couple of of interviews. And we're moving now to a a memoir written by a, a mother. It's called Leave Your Light On, The Musical Mantra Left Behind by an Illuminating Spirit. It is by Shelley Buck, and it is about her son, Ryder Buck, who uh, died way too soon. But it is her her memories of him, what she learned from him, from his life, from her life with him as his mother, etc. So definitely join me for that when I will be chatting with Shelley Buck. And again, the book is called Leave Your Light On. Thank you, as always, for joining me. You know that I appreciate you, and you know that I'm going to tell you that I hope you have a wonderful week, a wonderful day, wherever you are, a wonderful weekend, you know, whenever you're listening to this. But I hope that whatever time you are having, you find lots of time to get lost in a good book. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.